Okay, got the golden ratio grid on here. Got the sound check done. It's Tag Tuesday. Uh, originally, I had a scheduled a different video to go up today. So if people are wondering, if people I was talking to in the comments about my next video, it was going to be more horror mayhem stuff that's got moved a day in the future. I don't want to start doing two or three or four a day. Um, and uh, annoy people until I until I'm ready to thin that subscriber list out a little bit more. But I was gonna skip tags altogether, but this one popped up, and I saw it first on whose channel is this? Uh, Book chat with Pat, and it's such a great tag. I really want to talk about it, so I decided to do it. Uh, like I said, I watched uh, Book chat with Pat do it. Uh, this tag was created just today, I think, by Joe and Mary at BookBuds, which is a channel I've never seen. So that's great. Already I get to watch, uh, find a new channel to, to watch. And a lot of people have been tagged already. Uh, okay, I'm going to read her message here. I'll put all this, uh, or Joe and Mary's message here. I'll put all this info in the the uh, description, of course, the description, which is slowly dawning on me that nobody reads. So I'll put stuff in the descriptions and people will, and I can tell from comments that people leave on my videos that they had no idea that was uh, addressed. Um, but I assume people read the, the, the description in the tag videos so that they know what the tag is. Anyway, just in case they don't, I will read this message from BookBuds. A new original tag from BookBuds, the library tag. Did you know BookBuds films right next to a library? We had to make this tag. Let's talk about your library habits. We have questions for both of you, both those of you that go to the library and those of you who don't. Answer the questions that apply to you. So there are two sets of questions. So if you're watching this and thinking, I don't go to the library, I'm not going to do the tag, uh, look at the comments because there's a separate set of questions for people who don't go to the library. Anyway, I do go to the library, and so I am going to answer the first set, which is 11 questions, including tag some friends. If you don't go to the library, there's only seven questions to answer, because obviously your time is very valuable if you don't have time to go to the library. Um, so definitely look at the description here if you're at all interested in answering these. All right. Almost three minutes in, time to actually do the tag. Okay, number one, how often do you go to the library? Well, uh, as people probably know by now, if they've watched my channel, I'm no longer in the United States. I'm in Albania. I've never seen a library here. I'm sure they have some. I'm not sure of that. Uh, I was in Finland for about three months before coming here, and even there I would go to the library a lot because they have a lot of libraries there. Uh, Finland's a great country for book lovers, book readers, uh, theater goers. Anyway, there was a couple, I, there's even, and also in Stockholm, I was there for a week or so before then, there was just libraries everywhere. And I would go into them because I love walking around libraries, even if they're not, even if I don't, I'm not a member or anything. At home, I used to go to the library in Seattle, I would go, you know, every week. It depend on where I worked, different um, routes home and stuff. I used to stop in when I walked from one location where I worked. I would walk past the library in the International District where I lived. And I'd probably go in there every night that they were open. Just look for a few minutes. It's just another place to browse books, just to see what's on the new bookshelves. I used to go all the time. I'd sometimes go there and sit, especially in the summer. Uh, the air conditioning is pretty nice. When those, we used, we're getting these heat waves in Seattle now, which never used to happen. Um, and I never lived in a place that had air con. Uh, so I'd go to the library. Anyway, uh, so that's how often it is. Very often, but now not as often. Two, do you belong to more than one library system? Yes, I do. Again, Seattle... Uh, you're in the jurisdiction of two library systems, and I encourage people to join both if you're in Seattle. There's the Seattle Public Library, and there's also the King County Library. Seattle's in King County. 
which I only joined uh, just before the pandemic. And I joined because They seem to have a lot of books there. I have this, I have this uh, plug-in app that, um, for Amazon that I should probably tell people what that is now if, as I mention it, there's a plug-in you can get for Chrome that, and other browsers and things that will show you um, on sites like Amazon and I think even some of the other sales sites like A-Books and that, a lot of the U.S. sites and... Uh, Oh, a lot of sites, Library of America. It it, it plugs in there and it'll, and it'll look up the book on the page you're reading about, and it'll tell you if your library has it. And, you know, and there's makes some mistakes a lot of times. If you look up a book called, uh, I don't know, if you look up uh, the the. If you look up something with a generic title, it, it might give you a, a wrong prompt anyway. Um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, it is called, I think it's called, it takes a minute to load up here. But if you have a Chrome browser, it works. There's, it's a free plug-in. It probably works on other browsers too. It's not going to load this time, of course, Then I'm sitting here doing this. Oh, oh, it's just called library extension anyway. And so uh, you can plug in, you, you put your libraries in there um, by location and it'll search them for you. It'll also search Hoopla for you. Uh, it never works on Hoopla for me for some reason, but whatever. Uh, okay, let me get back to my camera so I can see myself, make sure I'm looking at least 10% of the time into the lens instead of just like gazing off into space okay so i do belong to more than one library system and i recommend looking around see how many library systems you can belong to especially if you're a big reader it'll it'll slow down those it'll compress those hold hold times for you if you have more than one library um and you use the geez what's the name of the app that we all use in the United States, if you have more than one library and you use the, uh, what's that stupid app called? I have to look up the name because otherwise it's, people in the comments are going to tell me the name of the app is this, you idiot. Um, what's the name of the app that everybody uses? I guess I'll have to look under app info because, uh, Libby. Um, so if, if, for example, you have two libraries plugged, two uh, different libraries plugged into your Libby, and you place a hold for a book um, that you're looking for, and both libraries have it, it'll put you on the shortest hold list. So that's an advantage of, of belonging to more than one library if you borrow a lot of stuff, either a lot of ebooks or a lot of uh, audiobooks. Now I gotta get back to the prompts because I messed up my screen. Hope I didn't lose it, okay. You belong to more than one library system. Yeah, number three, what percentage of books you read come from the library? Uh, used to be almost everything. For a few years, it was almost everything because what I'll do, you know, everything I could get from the library because I've got, I'm a very greedy reader. I'm constantly seeing stuff I want to read, thinking I want to read that, I want to read that, I want to read that. And so I would always check to see if the library has it and put it on hold half the time by the time it gets gets there uh it comes up and i go why did i put that i don't want to read that you know because it's six months later or whatever if it's a popular book uh of course a lot of things they don't have like uh, you know i've i focus i would spend most of my reading budget on you know just just wandering around a used bookstore and finding some treasure or or some book I just usually just really had to have right away that I couldn't wait. But that's pretty rare because I'm pretty patient because there's so many things I immediately want to read. Continuing my milk diet, which is, I don't know, I am got into this phase lately of just drink, putting so much milk in my coffee, but it tastes so good. Now I'm hooked on it that way. All right. 
So percentage used to be very high. Now it's quite low because I decided to really um, focus on re the Read What You Own Challenge and, and reading stuff on my Kindle that I already have, Project Gutenberg stuff, and just trying to use a smaller universe of books to choose from for a while just to get it under control um, so I don't really uh, check out very many books from the library right now. But over the past decade, let's say if you want to do it that way, I, th I would think it's probably 70% of the books uh, come from the library. All right, number four, do you listen to audiobooks or get ebooks from the library, or are you hooked on Audible or Amazon or something else? Okay, that's a couple different questions put together. Yes, I do listen to audiobooks. I do get ebooks from the library. That's the only thing I get now because I'm, even though I'm still a resident of King County, um, I'm traveling on a tourist visa and I still consider myself a Washington resident. And so that's where I get my ebooks that I check out. Uh, audiobooks for a while, I was reading, ton, listening to tons and tons and tons of audiobooks because of the job I had before I retired. In fact, I listened to almost every single, for example, this is an example, I listened to the complete works of Agatha Christie over a few months because I could listen to a book almost every day. We had 10 hour shifts and it was very easy to get through a one crime book a day or Fritz Robert Parker Spencer books, two of them a day. Um, so did quite a bit of that, those and you know, I'm, I always had a pl plenty of stuff on hold and and not in worried about any particular order or anything and just wait for them to come in and listen to them, which would be very prohibitive. Audible is just too expensive, in my opinion, for for that level of reading. Audible's kind of a... I don't really get Audible. I mean, I know I, I get it, but it's it's a book club where you buy an audio book for $15 a month, or is there 17 now or something? And you get a bunch of dumb freebies and stuff, of stuff that you probably would never want to bother listening to. You know, these sort of things that like a comedian will do a little radio play and then I'm on a Christmas story or something and just, just, it's nice to have kind of that extra stuff, but it's, it's kind of like just listening to a overproduced podcast People who listen to Audible probably know what I'm talking about, those kind of freebies, but you're paying like 16 bucks for an audiobook, but I'm never going to, I'm not going to listen to the same audiobook again and again. I would want something rather that I could rent, you know, and especially the amount I was of audiobooks I was using, you know, it's like, oh, I paid 15 bucks and I can listen to a 10 hour, okay, so what am I going to do for the other 29 days in the month but it, I guess Audible's good if you just have a, like a short commute you listen to an audiobook about a half hour a day of course audio audio audible has a lot of free good free stuff that has some giant books when I have been a member I've usually bought like the most hugest book I could like there's a Stephen Fry complete almost complete Sherlock Holmes doesn't have the last book in it the very final Holmes um, collection in it which isn't isn't even that good in my opinion but I th I think at the time there was that that Stephen Frears I keep saying Stephen Frears that's not who I mean you know who I mean Stephen from the BBC the guy who's the guy the BBC guy Stephen Fry um, you know Jeeves from that great uh, uh, British television at Japson of Jeeves and Wooster uh, Stephen Fry, so, who's always doing a, a ton of projects. That's the difference between American actors and British actors. Like an American actor, uh, they'll be in their big movie, and then they'll be on a thousand talk shows about their big movie, and then a British actor will be in like Game of Thrones, and they'll play a different character in Harry Potter, and then they'll go off and they'll do their 12-part uh, series uh, walking across the tundra, 
and then they'll do their 10 episodes of a intellectual game show and then they'll do their own chat show for five weeks and then they'll go on a book tour for their autobiography then they'll go on another book tour for their book about Chaucer and it's and then they'll have their six episode sitcom and then the next season starts and they, and they are back to doing the next Harry Potter movie and the cycle just continues and I, it's amazing some of those British uh, actors are such workaholics they've always got some different kind of project they really put it together anyway um, uh, okay so do you get like hooked on Audible, Amazon or something else I'm hooked on ebooks e e e uh Gutenberg.com ebooks, free ebooks. So I'm trying to say, there is kind of an equivalent for uh, audio, LibriVox, and there's a few apps that try and make a living out of claiming to be free ebook, free audiobook selection things, and then, and then they just put a bunch of LibriVox recordings on there because. And it's really uh, mean of me to say this because LibriVox recordings are all volunteer and and the people are working very hard and you can tell a lot of people are in their retirement and they just enjoy doing this for fun, but they're just terrible. Ter Some of the readings are just terrible. And I, and I say that as a person who hems and haws and then stammers and has no idea what he's talking about in my YouTube videos, but which means that's pretty hypocritical of me, but there's very few good LibriVox recordings. There's also annoying things that LibriVox makes you do, like uh, identify LibriVox and your name and everything at the beginning of every little file. So if, if you've got a Henry James story that's in three parts, you know, a third of the way through, it'll go, this is a LibriVox recording. Uh, the House on the Toilet by James, by Henry James. This is not, he didn't write The House to Let. Anyway, this LibriVox recording is read by Gordon McHale. And, you know, it's terrible. And a lot of people put these up on on YouTube and kind of cut them to some, some of the better faceless YouTube channels will, will edit them together and edit out all these translations but but they are kind of a pain because if you want to hear something good on youtube like like a like a really good podcaster and there's several options now there's really a few good different readers who do horror stories public domain horror stories and you have to kind of sort through all the librivox ones because they're not going to identify it anyway so I'm not a big librivox fan obviously so I do get my ebooks um, from Amazon. If I buy them, I don't really like to patronize Amazon when there's other options, but it is just so sim simpler because it goes right to the app. So I'm stuck that way. You know, I do buy stuff. I used to buy stuff. And I try to direct from publishers, but then you got to sideload it. You know, you, you got to find another way to get it on your Kindle. I'm thinking about going to a different e-reader. There's an expensive one uh, that it's going to, I think it's going to be worth it for me. Anyway, don't mean to get off on that. Boy, who listens to these? I know you're still with me, Faces Book Reviews. That's why you're getting tagged. All right, so I guess that's probably enough on question four. I'll try and speed up here. Question five, did you go to story time at the library as a kid? No, we didn't have that. I was a kid and I was born in 1961. I used to go to the library as much as I could. It was a pretty far walk from my house. The library in Sparks, Nevada, where I mostly grew up, was, I don't know, maybe a 45-minute walk, which is fine. Nothing else to do. Um, and we had an amazing, amazing library. It's still there in Reno, Nevada. If you're ever in Reno, Nevada, go to that library. It is incredible. Even when I was a kid, I used to go there and go, I can't believe there's something this nice in this city. It's got this like sort of big open level and you know, you're know, you sitting and you can hang out all day and there's like waterfalls and plants everywhere. So gorgeous. But they, there was nothing for kids. There was a kid's section. 
But the world's not made for kids. They didn't do kid stuff back then when I was a kid. Like you go to the kid section now, it's like a whole, it's like a playground. The kid section of the library now, there's cushions, there's tables, there's coloring books out, there's there's things to do, and they just, there's a whole stuff, lot of stuff going on there. We had books. There were books for kids. There was no library time for kids. There was no parental sub, uh, substituting at the library, which is fine because I moved to the adult books as soon as I could. Which I think I talked about in another video. I don't know which one, so I can't link to it, though. Okay. <clears throat> but what we did have at the library, they did have a screening room at the Reno Public Library, the main library, and I saw my first silent film. My one, Well, I don't know. I might have seen shorts and stuff, but I, we saw The Phantom of the Opera for free. I couldn't believe we could go see this movie for free. And my mom even had to call and ask. It was in the paper. So I'm like, that's really free? You just let people go in there and sit there and watch a movie? So she dropped us off, or, or one of the other parents dropped a bunch of us kids off. We sat through The Phantom of the Opera free. Loved Lon Chaney Sr. Um, did not have the color sequence in there, I know, because I remember being surprised by that years later when I saw it. But amazing movie. Uh, just incredible movie to watch. You don't need sound. I don't even think it had like a audio soundtrack or anything, and it was just, it was just. I think there was like one film nerd in there, like one beard, beardo, uh, twenty-five year old uh, college student film nerd guy in there, and it was just me, my brother, and like three of our friends in the neighborhood, and it was free. Of course, now we have YouTube where everything's free. Okay. And that kind of ties into the next question here. Do you, uh, have you ever borrowed a movie or video game from your library? I've never borrowed a video game. I think they have them at my library. I've never really played very many video games. And I really, I did have a, a, a Wii at one point and I got rid of it. And then I had a, what's the one, the, Xbox or what's the game whatever and I got rid of that too because I'd play like one game but I, I would get obsessed over it whatever stupid game it was I think I played two games to completion in my entire life like Grand Theft Auto like one of the first ones and this Godfather game which was like Grand Theft Auto that I, how do you get those not take over your life and then you just feel like shit like crap all the time while you're playing this game and your waking hours are... So I've never really gotten into video games and I used to joke, I, I know I'm telling this story again, but nobody watches every video, so... I, I used to tell people like, I'm gonna get into video games when I retire because I don't have plenty of time and I can really enjoy them, but there's no way I would spend my time doing that. Even though they are fun, they're probably just too fun for me. They're just too addicting. And I have the scrolling addiction, so that's plenty. All right, uh, so and but I have borrowed movies. Uh, I'll go through phases of borrowing movies. The thing with borrowing movies, of course, there are downloads. I've had issues any kind of borrowing movies from libraries because get the DVDs. There we skip. There we scratch to hell. There was a mess. Uh, there was a problem, and that gets frustrating. And with the app, the main app. Uh, for watching movies mm, that you can link through your library, Canopy, and also Hoopla, especially Canopy, it just it'll time out all the time. It's like very buggy, so I find those things kind of. And on Canopy, the 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 selection is pretty limited. Canopy is great for uh, putting things on your whole list that you think you want to watch that you're never really going to watch, you know, like a. They have a great series of uh, East German propaganda films that I would love to see. You know, dramatic films that are that are done from the propaganda point of view that are now all since there's no longer in East Germany. There's no longer an Eastern Bloc, a representation of Eastern Soviet bloc. So all the stuff's free and available now as educational material. And some of it looks pretty good. I don't really feel I'm going to be propagandized, but, you know, it's only so much time to watch stuff, and I, I, I 
mostly prefer to watch junk. Because junk is good. Movies are junk. Okay. Lost the page again. But there was a time when I was having a lot of trouble with my home internet service in Seattle and I got frustrated and cut it off because it was always not working and they were not helping me with it. So I thought, I've got a phone. That's going to be email. I'm not going to have home internet service. I have it at work. I have it at the library. I don't need it. And so immediately I realized how much time I spent online watching movies, streaming. So I started uh, checking stuff out from the library, and it was just too much of a hassle. But it would force me to watch and stick with a certain thing. Like I watched all of the Rockford Files, and I watched all of High Chaparral because those were available in my library. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but... I did watch a lot of DVDs when I was trying to live without a home internet connection, which didn't go. It went about as as you'd expect. Um, have, number seven, have you ever gotten fined for turning books late? If so, how do you feel about it? Uh, I don't care. I'm, in fact, I was happy to pay the fines. I have a story about that because it irritated me for years. Now the Seattle Library, and I think the King County Library, and I think a lot of other libraries, they, they kind of got rid of the fines. First they got rid of the fines for kids, which up, upset some people who are really rules-bound. You're teaching kids, you're not teaching lessons that they don't have to pay a fine, but the fines don't really do anything except create bureaucracy and paperwork and keep people from going back to the library, keep people from returning books because they don't want to pay the fine. My thing with a fine, I think I owed a fine of 15 cents once, and... And this was back before the internet and before the internet libraries online. And I, every time I'd go to the library and pick up my books, and they didn't even have self-checkout then, i go, I want to pay my fine. And they go, okay. And I, I'd take out a dollar. they go, oh, don't you have exact change? I know. Okay, okay, we'll just pay it later. We don't have change. And this went on for like four or five times. And, you know, because I, I never happened to have exactly 15 cents. I'd have probably a quarter or something or a dollar bill or something. And I, even back then, I never carried cash. And finally, uh, she goes, okay. And she gave me that. And she had the change. And she took the 15 cents. And I made some remark like, oh, I've been trying to pay this, but nobody wants to take my money. And she thought I said, everybody wants to take my money. Like I was complaining about the 15 cent fine. And that really irritated me. Because all I'd been trying to do for a year is pay this stupid fine so I wouldn't have to see it, you know, come up on my account all the time and, and you know, have these people ask about it and then not take the money because they don't have 65 cents in their drawer. Anyway, so uh, you can see how I hold on to things. But now I had a chance to finally tell that story that happened to me like 30 years ago and I haven't let go of it. All right, so I don't feel bad about the fines. I would pay them, you know, if, if they required them. I think it's just basically it turned out they found out that they, they don't gain anything from the fines. It's just like one of those extra bureaucracies that, you know, it's something they have to keep track of. It doesn't encourage people to return the books on time. The people that are late are going to be late, and then they're not going to use the library. And the, the books... And they're not losing books by not collecting fines because the people do bring the books back. You know, they have other, other ways to keep people from borrowing too many books. They have limits on the number of books you can borrow, and some of those limits they're, they're tightening up on. I noticed on ebooks, on, on some of the platforms, because ebooks are expensive for them to buy. Um, publishers kind of soak libraries on the ebook costs. And make them uh, buy them again after a certain point. You know, like if a library buys a book, they have that book until it falls apart. They have that book until they can't tape it back together again. Which, for most books, let's be honest, is more uh, wear than it's ever going to get. But with ebooks, there's the mercy of the publishers who decide, well, we're only going to let you borrow, have 100 borrows of this or whatever, and then we're going to make you pay for it again. So, just another way that uh, electronic um, 
content, content that they tell you you can buy, content they tell you you own is not really yours, and that's why there's this movement on, especially uh, in the movie world of returning to physical media and hold on to your physical media because just because you buy a book on Amazon or you buy a show on iTunes doesn't mean a year from now you're going to have access to that show that you bought because they've changed the terms of service. Didn't mean to get political here. Okay, so um, that's how I feel about fines. I don't... I, whether the fine is there or not, I want to return my items on time or as early as I can so that other people can use them. If if I've got a book and and uh, I've finished it or I know that I'm not going to read it, I'll take it back as soon as I reasonably can because somebody else might be waiting for that book. And that's the fine that somebody else has to wait when they don't have to. Okay, Number eight, do you attend special events groups or book sales at the library? Uh, no, I don't think I've ever done that. Uh, book sales at the Seattle Library were usually out in the hinterlands someplace that I couldn't get to. I don't think I've ever gone to any of those. The main library in downtown Seattle does have a coffee shop kind of place where they sell used books, and their prices are not... Um, you know, books. Part of the part of the books are trying to get rid of. They sell or donations, and the prices are not really anything to to write home about. Okay, number nine. Have you ever given or taken a book from a little free library, a book box, or a book swap? No. Well, I might have taken one or two from a free library. I'm sure if I did, I always made point to put them back. There are a lot of free libraries in Seattle, but just never really around where I was and. Usually the stuff in there is just not that appealing. In a place like Seattle where there's a lot, a lot of readers, a lot of other options for, for like selling your books back to a used bookstore or something. So all the good books really go through those other channels and people put like, you know, little free inspirational tracks and stuff in, in those. Um, they're, they're not really that good, I think. But there is a, what I would do with a book if I had one or two that I couldn't sell back to a used bookstore or give to a friend or or just th throw away after it fell apart, which happened a few times very sadly. Or donate to Goodwill, that kind of thing, which I would do most of the time. Is put them in a coffee shop, a coffee place that had a, a place for books. So I, I enjoyed leaving stuff in there, and I would put my Alfred Hitchcock and Ellery Queen magazines in those two. And people seem to enjoy picking those up there. You know, usually I'll go back next time I go back. Whatever I put there is gone, so somebody took it and kept it. Or I'd put them just in the lobby of my building. Um, because people occasionally do that. You know, I put it right under the sign that says, don't leave your free crap here. And then somebody picks it up before the before the billing manager gets back. So I haven't any books to swap or give away or anything since then. I did leave, I had one physical book with me when I left Seattle, the fifth volume of the Library of America's Henry James um, stories. Because I'd read the other four, I didn't want to get rid of it and I just not complete the set even though if you want to read Henry James, you can definitely skip skip volume five of his collected short stories. You can skip volume one, you can skip volume five, you could probably skip most of volume four. Nowadays, I would never read anybody's, um, I will not say nobody's, but I would really avoid reading anybody's complete short stories, especially from the time when short stories were a paying concern where people can make a substantial part of their living from short stories, which means they would write a lot of them. Henry James himself, I, f I forget how many Henry stories are in these five volumes. It's like a 70 or 90, something like that, in five volumes, and they're all thousand-page volumes. So a Henry James story is like a Robert Parker Spencer for hire novel. You know, it's 40, 50,000 words still considered a short story for some reason. 
Um, but half, half in that Library of America Henry James edition, half of those stories were had not appeared since um, since the original magazine publication, meaning he never published them. And at the end of his life, he had a whole edition of, of his, this is pretty famous, of corrected texts where he put everything out that he wanted to put out and rewrote a bunch of it. And so half the stuff he didn't consider at all worth saving. Just so take what you will of that. There's still interesting stuff in there. Um, you should read, if you want to read any Henry James at all, Turn of the Screw really is as good as they say it is. If you want to read one Victorian, uh, he's not Victorian, I guess, because he's American, but if you want to read one late 19th century ghost story, it really is the best one. And there's audio versions of it, and it's that's a good recommendation for horror mayhem. Isn't this a tag video? Oh, my God. Okay, so that's, yes, that is my answer to have I ever done a library or book swap uh, with about 25 minutes about the short fiction of Henry James for absolutely no reason at all. Bonus, does your librarian know you by name? No, definitely not. Um, 11, tag some friends. Okay, so I'm going to try and be responsible with my tagging. I'm not going to say any names here. Some people I end up tagging a lot the same. Other people I'll tag and they very politely write back and say, thank you for the tag. I don't have time to do it. Other people, uh, which is fine. And other people write back and say, thank you for the tag. I was actually already did this one. Here's the link. So I apologize in advance for people. I do try and avoid tagging I'm going to try and avoid tagging big accounts because I assume they get tagged on a lot of things. However, I am going to try and tag everyone I can think of that I know who lives outside of the United States because that's selfishly for me because I'm interested about what like, how libraries work in the in other countries. So I know, um, I won't mention everybody here I'm going to tag, but I'm going to tag uh, Mark at Book Time with Elvis and maybe he'll... he'll if he's interested in talking about what the library situation is different in the Czech Republic as opposed to Great Britain, where he's from, or or Jay Shea, who I think, if I got this wrong, I'm, I'm sorry, who I think lives in Canada. I'm kind of interested in the library system in Canada. And a few others uh, around the world. Uh, if I tag somebody who actually lives in the United States, but I just made a mistake because they're from someplace else originally, I apologize for miss... Um, mislabeling your location and if I miss some people and if you live outside the United States and you decide to do this tag uh, let me know I'd be curious to hear about that looking over this list there's a lot of people that I would tag who Pat has already tagged and I'm sure the original person tagged a lot of good people too so who knows who gets tagged it might be you if if you don't want to do it uh, no big deal. You don't have to write me and tell me. If you want to write me and tell me, please don't tag me on stuff because it's annoying. Yeah, definitely do that. I will not be offended. If you don't, if you see yourself tagged and you just want to ignore it, I think that's totally legitimate. Especially some of these accounts, I can't imagine how many, how many tag requests they get. How many, how many times a day does Michael K. Vaughn get get tagged in a video? I probably tag him like well, three times a week. Anyway, uh, if you do it, let me know. Once again, uh, as a reminder, in, uh, look in the comments to see the alternate version of this tag where you can answer questions about uh, why you don't go to the library, why you think libraries are foul garbage, uh, uh, social engineering that should be uh, uh, banned from everybody for forever, and... No, that's a joke. That's not with the the second, the, the don't go library tag is. But that would be very interesting. I would like to see some of these. I don't know that many people who are going to do that tag if they don't go to the library. But remember, if you don't go to the library, that is an option as well. This is the end of the recording.